Well, good morning and welcome to Resurrection Presbyterian here in Knoxville. We're glad to have you with us here this morning while we continue to miss being together in person. We are grateful to be able to gather in spirit during this unprecedented time. It's a good opportunity for us to come and to connect with each other in spirit, but also to connect with God. This particular cultural moment has revealed a number of things in our lives and in our world. It has shown what we might refer to as cracks in the secular. And in the midst of seeing cracks in the secular, it gives us a longing, a longing for transcendence, a longing for something outside of ourselves, a longing for something deeply spiritual, a longing for God. And that's what we're here to do. We're here to connect and to seek God and to ask Him to meet with us this morning and worship. We're a church that is centered around this transformative message called the gospel. The gospel is not good advice. The gospel is good news that Christ has overcome sin and death and that he rules and he reigns. And our hope is built upon this gospel. This gospel is what the Christian needs to grow in Christ. The gospel is what the seeker needs to come to know Christ. And the gospel is even what can answer the potentially investigative truth claims that the skeptic has about Christianity. So no matter where you're coming from spiritually, we're really glad and thankful to have you with us here this morning. I have just a few announcements that I want to put before you. You can see these announcements on your screen. These announcements include, we will continue to be online in our worship exclusively throughout the month of May. We also want to continue to communicate our commitment to meeting needs both internally and externally as it relates to this uh, coronavirus. And so we would encourage you to seek the information that is provided both on the screen and also on our website. Additionally, we have an aspect of our worship that is geared towards kids. We have videos for preschoolers and also through K through third Uh, On our website as well, on the online worship portal, I know many people have been taking advantage of those. You can find those on the information provided. And then lastly, the best way to stay in touch touch with what is going on in our life together is through our weekly email and through our website and through our various social media channels. So you can avail yourself to those. And please reach out to us if you have any further questions. Well, now we begin our time this morning with an opportunity to be still so that we can know who God is, to quiet our hearts and to contemplate as we approach our worship this morning. So now we will move into a time of silent reflection. Well, I invite you to stand this morning in your homes for our call to worship from Psalm 23, and we'll read this collectively together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me 
in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. Alleluia. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Alleluia. Let's sing together this great hymn, Come Thou Found. Come Thou Found of every blessing to my heart to sing thy grace streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise teach me some melodious song sung by flaming tongues above praise the mountain I'm fixed upon mount of god I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I'm come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me with a stranger, one drink from the fold of God, he to rescue. Interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debt daily I'm constrained to be. Let that grace now. This morning, our confession of faith comes from the Westminster Shorter Catechism. Christians, what is repentance unto life? Repentance leading to life is a saving grace by which a sinner, having truly realized his sin and grasped the mercy of God in Christ, turns from his sin with grief and hatred and turns to God with full resolve and effort after new obedience. Let's sing together. Glory be to the Father and to the We come now to our communal confession of sin. This is an opportunity for us to join together in our brokenness and to appeal to God to be able to be honest, to repent, and to receive His bold love. Let's pray this communal confession of sin together. Almighty God, in raising Jesus from the grave, you shattered the power of sin and death. We confess that we remain captive to doubt and fear, 
bound by the ways that lead to death. We overlook the poor and the hungry and pass by those who mourn. We are deaf to the cries of the oppressed and indifferent to calls for peace. We despise the weak and abuse the earth you made. Forgive us, God of mercy. Help us to trust your power to change our lives and make us new, that we may know the joy of life abundant given in Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. Amen. I would encourage you now to lift your heads, to open your hearts, and to even rise to hear this assurance of forgiveness. This morning, the assurance of forgiveness is a proclamation of the gospel, and the gospel is not good advice, but the gospel is good news. Hear this good news this morning from Romans chapter 10. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead you will be saved. Christians, I declare to you the forgiveness of your sins in Jesus' name, because our help is in the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, open our lips. Let's continue to worship together as we sing Jesus all for Jesus. Jesus, all for Jesus, all I am and have and ever hope to be. 
Father in heaven, we thank you for this time to be here together, uh, even remotely, but in spirit. I pray uh, for the day that we'd be able to come back together to worship physically uh, with one another. Uh, Lord, I pray for our community here locally, for men and women who are seeking to reopen businesses. We pray for wisdom and discernment. I pray for our leaders, uh, the elected officials here locally, and also at a national level who are making decisions uh, amid, amongst great uncertainty. We pray for clarity and for wisdom. Lord, I, cha- I pray for the members of this body, uh, for the needs that they may have financially, emotionally, spiritually, and Father, even for those who may just need rest, we pray that you would meet us. I pray for Brent as he brings your word this morning. I pray, Lord, that it would truly be your word and not his, that you would speak to us uh, boldly through him. Bless him as he brings it to us. Uh, Father, as people who are called to be of hope, I pray that um, Easter that we celebrated a few weeks ago would hang in our minds which, with much more weight uh, than this virus or whatever the issue of the day that we may be facing is. Father, we um, now come together praying as you has, have taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, let's open our hearts and our minds for the reading of the scripture this morning. My soul finds rest in God alone. My salvation comes from Him. My soul finds rest, God is my hope, I will not be shaken, I will not be shaken. My soul finds rest in God alone, my salvation comes from My soul finds rest, God is my hope, I will not be shaken, I will not be shaken. Our Easter reading this morning is from the Acts of the Apostles, Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, Attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our gospel reading this morning is from the book of Mark, chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. On that day... When evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? 
Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? The Gospel of our Lord. Glory to you, Lord Christ. We continue our study this morning in the book of Jonah. We began this series last week as we look at this significant minor prophet that was written around the 8th century. We looked last week at Jonah chapter 1, and this morning we turn our attention to Jonah chapter 2. Jonah, among other things, is well known because of the big fish. However, it's important for us not to focus too much upon the fish because that's not the primary point of the book. One preacher, G. Campbell Morgan, said this, Men have been looking so hard at the great fish that they have failed to see the great God. Jonah is primarily not about the fish. Jonah is primarily about God. It's about God's kindness. It's about God's mercy. It's about God's compassion. And as a result of God's kindness, his mercy, and his compassion, it's also about our opportunity to respond to that through repentance. And so we come this morning to Jonah chapter 2, and we're going to read this together this morning. Feel free to stand even if you would like to in your home. That's our typical practice when we're in worship together. And we'll actually begin the reading this morning from Jonah chapter 1, the last verse, verse 17, and then we'll read through Jonah chapter 2, verse 10. So hear the word of the Lord this morning from Jonah chapter 2. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice, for you cast me into the deep heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall look again upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head at the roots of the mountains. And I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought me up, my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. This is the word of the Lord. Pray with me. Father, we pray this morning that you would show us your truth and that your truth would set us free. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I trust that many of you are familiar with the Jesus Storybook Bible. It is a Bible that was intended for kids, written by Sally Lloyd-Jones. She's a British writer that has essentially compiled a number of Tim Keller sermons. Tim Keller, the pastor, former pastor of Redeemer in New York City, and she's compiled a really wonderful overarching narrative of the scriptures that's not exhaustive for the Bible, yet it is amazingly descriptive of God's plan of redemption and deliverance through the Old and the New Testament. And her account of Jonah in the Jesus Storybook Bible is particularly fantastic. And so to catch us up to where we began last week and where we find ourselves this morning in Jonah chapter 2, I just wanted to begin by reading an excerpt from the Jesus Storybook Bible according to Sally Lloyd-Jones, her interpretation and paraphrase of what's going on in the book of Jonah. So would you hear this morning as we begin, she begins her writing in the Jesus Storybook Bible. God had a job for Jonah, but Jonah didn't want it. Go to Nineveh, God said, and tell your worst enemies that I love them. No, said Jonah. Those are bad people doing bad things. Exactly, said God. They will have run far away from me, but I can't stop loving them. I will give them a new start. I will forgive them. No, said Jonah. They don't deserve it. 
I'll run away, Jonah said to himself, far away, so far away that God won't be able to find me. Then I won't have to do what God says. It's a good plan, he said, because as far as he knew, it was a good plan. But of course, it wasn't a good plan at all. It was a silly plan because you can run away from God, but he will always come find you. Jonah went ahead with his not very good plan. One ticket to not Nineveh, please, he said, and boarded a boat sailing in the very opposite direction of Nineveh. Well, it wasn't long before a fierce wind blew and the boat started to lurch and pitch and roll and everyone started turning green and Jonah sat bolt upright in his bed. You see, the first thing that went wrong with Jonah's not very good plan was that God sent a big storm after him. The sailors couldn't sail their ship properly. We're sinking, they screamed, and started throwing everything overboard, suitcases, food, whatever they could find. By now, Jonah knew that the storm was his fault. Throw me in instead, he shouted to the sailors, and the storm will stop. The sailors weren't sure. It's the only way you can be saved, Jonah cried, and so one, two, three, splash. No sooner had Jonah hit the water than the waves grew calm, The wind died down and the storm stopped. Just then, when Jonah thought it was all over, when he was sure he was going to drown, God sent a big fish to rescue him. The fish swallowed Jonah whole with one big gulp. So that's where we are in the story. Jonah is in the midst of rebellion. And one of the things that's important for us to know this morning is that we are Jonah. Of course, we have not been called in the same way that Jonah was called, but there's every person is living in one way or another in rebellion to who God is and what he has called us to. And so one of the reasons that we resonate so much with Jonah is that we are Jonah. Well, as we look at Jonah chapter 2 this morning, the main overarching idea that I want us to focus on is simply this, God meets us where we are. The good news of Jonah chapter 2, the good news of the gospel this morning is that God meets us where we are. Wherever we are, God meets us. But not only does God meet us where we are, but God doesn't keep us where we are. You see, it wouldn't be good news if God did not meet us where we are, but it also would not be good news if God kept us where we are. But the good news is that God meets us where we are, but he does not keep us where we are. I'm afraid that many of us have concluded, either ultimately or at least experientially in our lives, that we're too far gone, that God could not actually meet us. Maybe we are wallowing in the billows and the waves of guilt and shame that roll over us. And that might be the case for some of you that would put yourselves outside the boundary of Christianity. One of the things that is a defeater for you, an aversion maybe that you have to Christianity is your own guilt and your own shame. You've concluded, morally speaking, that you're too far gone. And even if that's not where you are, ultimately, you really are a Christian, your experience on a daily basis is one where you feel as if you are too far gone and God cannot meet you. But Jonah chapter 2 tells us that God meets us where we are and he gives us his grace. Jerry Bridges, great author that had a lot of influence in evangelical Christianity in the latter half of the 20th century, speaking of God's grace, said this simply, our worst days are never so bad that we're beyond the reach of God's grace. Our worst days are never so bad that we are beyond the reach of God's grace. But he goes on to say, and our best days are never so good that that they are beyond the need of God's grace. So our worst days are never so bad that we're beyond the reach of God's grace. And our best days are never so good that we're beyond the need of God's grace. God's grace reaches to all of us. God's grace reaches to the unrighteous and God's grace reaches to the self-righteous. God meets us where we are just in the same way that he met Jonah where he was in chapter two. To look at this overarching idea in a little more detail, I want us to look at Jonah's prayer, at Jonah's confession in chapter 2 at Jonah's psalm of thanksgiving as Jonah reflects upon his descent 
and as Jonah reflects upon his rescue. So God meets us where we are in the same way that he met Jonah where he was. He met Jonah in the midst of his descent, and he also met Jonah in the midst of his rescue. So let's look first at God meeting Jonah in the midst of his descent, and Jonah reporting this and recalling this by drawing upon the Psalms. Jonah prays to God as he, in the, as he is in the belly of a whale. He prays to God a psalm. He prays to God the Psalms. That's what Hebrews did back in the Old Testament. And in fact, that's what Jesus did too. They primarily prayed the Psalms. As a side note, that would be good advice for us. Prayer can be a perplexing and a hard thing, but a way to simplify it would be to simply use the prayer book, the hymn book, of God's people, which is the Psalms. And that's what Jonah does. Jonah recalls different aspects of different Psalms and he compiles them together in this prayer in the belly of the fish and he prays a Psalm of gratitude, a Psalm of thanksgiving. And and he begins that Psalm and this prayer by describing and reporting his descent, his descent into the sea, his descent into the belly of this fish. He describes what some would call a severe mercy. Sheldon Van Auken is an author that wrote a book entitled Severe Mercy. And he was talking about a concept that had developed in his own life as he came to fall in love with his wife and then came to become a Christian, confess faith in Christ, and developed a friendship with C.S. Lewis. And these things happened, and then not long after these things happened, his, vice contra- his wife contracted a deadly virus that took her life, which of course was crushing. But through God's grace, God dealt with Sheldon Van Auken in a way, and C.S. Lewis helped him to understand that while this was severe and bitter, God was still merciful. God normatively works in ways that could be described as severe mercies. It seems that Flannery O'Connor understood this. You can see this in various aspects of her writing, the great Catholic Southern writer, Flannery O'Connor. But one of the ways you see it displayed the most as far as her understanding her own descent and the way in which God uses severe mercies and the way in which God uses brokenness. You can see this in her prayer journal. Her prayer journal was actually just published a few years ago, but it was written in 1947 when she was at a writer's conference studying at the University of Iowa. And Flannery O'Connor's candor and her honesty about who she is is really amazing. And at one point in her prayer journal, she prays this, God Please help me to get down under things and find where you are. God, please help me to get down under things and find where you are. You see, that's where we find God so often. We find God in the midst of a descent. And God finds us in the midst of a descent. God finds us down in the valley that the psalmist speaks about down in the valley that we saw in our silent reflection in the song from the head and the heart. That's where God finds us because we're in the midst of going down. We're in the midst of a descent, just like, jo- just like Jonah was. It's interesting to see throughout the book of Jonah, but particularly in these first two chapters, how Jonah was on a trajectory downward. Literally, the text tells us that Jonah was going down to Joppa. Jonah went down to get on a ship. Jonah went down into the bow of the ship. And then finally we see Jonah going down into the depths of the ocean. You see, Jonah describes his descent and his rebellion of God by going down, down to Joppa, down to the ship, down to the bottom of the ship, and then down ultimately to the bottom of the ocean. One scholar says this, each stage symbolizes a further movement away from God. Now when Jonah can sink no lower, the Lord intervenes and raises him upward. You see, Jonah reflects in this prayer about his descent. He also reflects in this prayer about how things in his life came to a screeching halt. So there was a lot of activity in Jonah chapter 1, God speaking to Jonah, Jonah running from God, Jonah buying a ticket, Jonah getting on a ship, a storm 
waves, all kinds of chaos ensues. And then the action of Jonah being thrust overboard, which actually chapter two tells us that God thrust him overboard. But we know in chapter one that the sailors actually thrust him overboard. But what that is really giving tribute to is God's providence and the fact that God is sovereign over all things. But the point being, there was a lot of action in this descent. And then everything comes to a screeching halt when the fish swallows Jonah. And all of a sudden, there is a sense of stillness. Jonah, at this point, quite literally is isolated. He's quarantined, not into his home because of a virus, but Jonah is quarantined and isolated in the belly of a fish. All action has ceased and it has halted. And it gives Jonah the opportunity to reflect. It gives us also the opportunity to reflect this morning not only because of what we're experiencing in our culture, which is unprecedented and which cannot be ignored. There's a sense, I know, where we have corona fatigue. Yet at the same time, we can't ignore the reality of what's going on and the fact that our life and the action that we live in has come to a screeching halt. And I just simply want us to reflect for a moment what we're doing right now in our lives with regard to the action coming to a halt. Jonah started to contemplate and reflect and really do some introspection and to do some reflection upon who God is. You see, when things come to a screeching halt, there's various things that we can do. There's different responses. We can harden our hearts even deeper. Jonah could have done that. We can numb our hearts to not deal with the silence and how the action has stopped, or we can contemplate and we can reflect in the midst of things coming to a screeching halt. And that's what Jonah starts to do. I think we have to ask ourselves the question as we're experiencing this unprecedented time in our lives that has far-reaching implications to every aspects, uh, every aspect of our lives personally, but then also communally, both in our country and throughout the globe. If we don't ask the question, what is God doing, then we're missing something. Now, we can't answer that question objectively. What is God up to with this particular cultural moment on an objective, universal scale? But we can answer the question, what is God doing in my life, subjectively and personally, during this time where things have come to a screeching halt? I think we have to do that. If not, we're not going to be able to utilize the way in which God is working through what for many is a severe mercy. But by God's grace, Jonah is able to reflect upon his descent, reflect upon the screeching halt, this moment where all action stops. Jonah is able to dialogue with God and with himself about his failure. Jonah is able to learn that failure is a great teacher. And we know this in our own lives Many of us would testify to the fact at the moments in which we have failed. I mean, Jonah has failed miserably here. It also became an opportunity to learn and to teach. One of the things that we're enjoying during this time, my son and I have started watching the documentary, The Last Dance, which chronicles the 1997 Chicago Bulls, uh, arguably the greatest basketball franchise to ever walk on the floor of the 1990s Bulls with the greatest player to ever play the game, Michael Jordan. And it's very interesting as they show you different aspects of who Michael Jordan is. It's well known that when Michael Jordan was a sophomore in high school, he was cut from the varsity basketball team. Failure. But he learned from that failure and went to work harder and become stronger and as it were, become the greatest basketball player to ever play the game. Many famous people that are highly successful have similar stories. J.K. Rowling documents well what she would call her life being, prior to Harry Potter, an epic failure. Those are her words. Her life was what she would consider to be an epic failure. She had had a marriage that had fallen apart. She was a single mother. She was jobless and close to homeless. And she took the, this failure and these aspects of her life, and she said that she put all of her energy into writing, into writing 
what is arguably the greatest set of children's literature that have ever been published. You see, failure ends up becoming an amazing teacher. And Jonah is seeing this as he reflects upon his descent. Are you willing to look at your own descent? Am am I willing to reflect upon the moral descent of our souls and our minds in our lives that actually lead us to God. You see, our descent is actually what allows us to connect with God because a relationship with God is built upon dependence. It is built upon neediness and brokenness. And this is why Jonah too is so beautiful because we are Jonah. We have failed. We have rebelled. We are broken. We are in need of God's grace. We are in need of God meeting us in the midst of where we are because it's in the midst of our brokenness and our sin that we see God most clearly. Jesus came for sinners. He did not come for those who are righteous. And the bigger and greater concept we have of our own sin and our own brokenness, the bigger and the greater concept we will have of God's love for us. The greater our sin, the greater the cross. But it's hard for many of us, especially those of us who would consider ourselves to be religious, good church-going people, it's hard for us to see our sins as such that would be descents and ways in which we need God. C.S. Lewis understood this very well. I was reminded again recently of his uh, uh, dealing with this in mere Christianity and his section on Christian behavior. And specifically, he's talking about chastity and and sexual morality. He's talking about the sins of the flesh. And he says this, talking about the need that we have to recognize our own sinfulness. If anyone thinks that Christians regard unchastity, unchastity is the supreme vice, he is quite wrong. The sins of the flesh are bad, And Jonah's are clear, his sins of the flesh are right before us. But they are the least bad of all sins, C.S. Lewis says. All the worst pleasures are purely spiritual. The pleasure of putting other people in the wrong, of bossing and patronizing and spoiling sport and backbiting, the pleasures of power and hatred. For these are two things, for there are two things inside me competing with the human self, which I must try to become. They are the animal self and the diabolical self. The diabolical self is the worst of the two. And he's speaking of the diabolical self being the sins of the spirit and the animal self being the sins of the flesh. He goes on to say, that is why a cold self-righteous prig who goes regularly to church may be far nearer to hell than a prostitute. But of course, it is better to be neither. We really do if we want to experience the rescue and the grace and the steadfast love that God provides. We must embrace first our sin, our rebellion, our brokenness. We must understand what John Newton, the great preacher and hymn writer in the 18th century talked about counterintuitively when he reflected upon in a letter, in an essay, as he spoke about the advantages of indwelling sin. Have you ever thought about indwelling sin having advantages. Now, I get that there's a fine line there and we need to be careful not to condone sin, but Newton outlines this very clearly when he says, one of the overarching advantages to our sin that dwells within us is it takes us to our neediness. It takes us to our knees. It shows us our brokenness, which then ends up leading us to God's love. And to mention Flannery O'Connor Again, she speaks about her own sense of brokenness and neediness, but also her desire to love God more deeply. And that's what really causes us to want to love God more deeply is to see our neediness and our brokenness. And we see that clearly in Jonah. If we have a big need, then we have a big need for a big Savior, which increases our love. Flannery O'Connor says this once again from her prayer journal. Dear Lord, please make me want you. Dear Lord, please make me want you. It would be the greatest bliss, not just to want you when I think about you, but to want you all the time. To have the want driving in me, to have it like a cancer in me. It would kill me like a cancer, and that would be fulfillment. 
She talks about wanting to want God and love him so deeply that it would capture her like a cancer. Well, I think we see evidence of this in Jonah. As he realizes his descent and his brokenness and his need, he portrays this and voices this to God. And then he reflects upon not only his descent, but he reflects upon his rescue and the way in which God meets him in his need. And he does this in verses 8 and 9. He has a seemingly random mention to idolatry and how those who give themselves to idols have forsaken something. But the word he uses originally, if we look at it in the Hebrew, of what these people, what we have forsaken when we do not receive the rescue that God has for us, he says that they have forsaken God's steadfast love. They have forsaken God's kindness. They have forsaken God's Grace. Now, I'll be honest, you don't need to know a lot of Hebrew. I learned Hebrew at one point, and I, to this day, don't know a lot of Hebrew, it seems, anymore. But one word in Hebrew that you should know is the word that is used in verse 8 that is translated steadfast love. And the Hebrew word is hesed. Hesed means steadfast love, it means grace, it means God's kindness. God's chesed for his people is a radically transforming concept that Jonah speaks about in verse 8 because it really captures in one word, far more than one word, it captures the gospel. It captures the reality of God's mercy, of God's kindness, of God's steadfast love, of God's covenant relationship with his people. And Jonah says, when we don't turn to God and we don't receive his rescue, we forsake his chesed. And then Jonah goes on to reflect upon God's grace as he speaks about salvation. And this is really the climactic point of Jonah's prayer here at the end. It's also what could be said, the most climactic phrase in scripture. And that is that salvation comes from the Lord. The Hebrew word for salvation, I told you only really needed to know one, but if you wanted to know two, the Hebrew word for salvation would also be a good one to know as Jonah reflects upon his rescue in the midst of his descent. God not only rescues him with hesed, but God also provides for him Yeshua, which means salvation. And interestingly enough, he says salvation comes from, using a preposition there, one place, Yeshua comes from one place. It comes from the Lord. We can't save ourselves is what Jonah is saying. Salvation does not come from anything humanly speaking. Salvation comes from the Lord by his pure, unadulterated chesed. The word Yeshua is very interesting because it's also not only the root word for how we translate salvation, but Yeshua in the Hebrew is also the word that is the root form of what becomes the name Joshua. Joshua in the Old Testament is the deliverer of God's people. But it doesn't stop there. Yeshua means salvation and Yeshua means Joshua. But Yeshua also, if we were to transcribe it from Hebrew into Greek, you know what else? Yeshua is translated to mean Jesus. Salvation comes from the Lord. And Jonah reflects upon the way in which his rescue happens simply by God's grace. Tim Keller says this, No human heart will learn its sinfulness and impotence spiritually by being told it is sinful. It will have to be shown often in brutal experience. No human heart will dare to believe in such free, costly grace unless it is the only hope we have. It is a combination of hard circumstances, insight from the biblical gospel of atonement for sin, and prevailing prayer that can move us to wonder and amazement, even in the darkest, deepest places. We can't simply be told about our sin. We have to be shown our sin in order to receive this hesed love and rescue that God has provided for it and provided for us. And Jonah in chapter two really receives this. He finds a respite. He finds a peace. He finds a good place for his soul and for his spirit. And you know, it's very interesting for us to note as we start to conclude here that Jonah experiences 
this salvation, this Hesed, this Yeshua. He experiences this in praise and gratitude and thanksgiving, not knowing whether God's going to physically save his life or not. You see, the greater deliverance in Jonah chapter 2 is not so much that the fish has spat Jonah out of his mouth and onto the shore and therefore allows him to live. But the greater deliverance is the spiritual deliverance through God's rescue of his soul in order for him to find comfort and hope in that. And the last point I want to make in conclusion has to do with where specifically Jonah finds a refuge for his soul in this text. At two different points, Jonah is calling upon God and speaking of his own sin, and speaking of God's rescue and God's grace and the gospel love, steadfast love that God can show him in the midst of his own brokenness. Jonah says in verse 4 and in verse 7 that he goes to the temple in order for his soul to find rest. Well, it's not just the temple in general, but specifically he goes to the temple to find something within the temple. And in the Old Testament sacrificial system, the most important part of the temple was a physical piece of gold called the mercy seat. You see, the mercy seat was a bar or tablet or bench, if you will, of gold that covered the Ten Commandments and the Ark of the Covenant. And on the Day of the Atonement, the priest would go into the temple. Once again, that Jonah mentions twice. That's where he finds refuge for his weary life, refuge for his weary soul. He goes to the temple in order to go to the mercy seat, this piece of gold on the day of the atonement where the priest would come in and he would sprinkle blood on the mercy seat. The song that we're about to sing in closing speaks about the refuge that Jonah found for his soul. It speaks about the refuge that we find for our souls. Our refuge is found for our souls, because it's found within the temple on the mercy seat. It's found within God's love and his sacrifice through his son, Jesus Christ. I'll read one lyric from the song in closing, and then we'll get to sing it and reflect upon it in just a minute. The song is entitled, Dear Refuge of My Weary Soul, written by Anne Steele. And she writes, Dear Refuge of My Weary Soul. And then in the last verse, Thy mercy seat is open still Here let my soul retreat. With humble hope attend thy will and wait beneath thy feet. Thy mercy seat is open still. Here let my soul retreat. With humble hope attend thy will and wait beneath thy feet. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you rescue us. We thank you that you meet us in the midst of our descent, that you meet us in brokenness. We thank you that your grace is so great that there's no way we can ever fall out of reach from your saving, rescuing Hesed, your steadfast love. I pray that we would see ourselves and our sin more fully. And then, Father, I pray that we would see your love and your grace even more fully than our sin. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. At this time, we'll be singing our closing hymn, Dear Refuge of My Weary Soul. It's going to be a little more contemplative in nature, so please feel free to join in when you feel ready.
this time, let's give God thanks for his goodness and his faithfulness to us as we sing the doxology together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Would you receive this good word from the Lord now as you open your arms to symbolize your reception of this benediction? May the loving power of God, which raised Jesus to new life, strengthen you in hope, enrich you with his love, and fill you with joy in the faith. Amen. Thanks be to God.